In this lesson, we're going to be looking at river processes, um, which is the syllabus content two uh, on um, natural environment. So um, here we'll be looking at drainage basins, uh, hydrological cycle, and um, possibly a river profile, which will be um, the first part in the series of river processes um, for Cambridge IGCSE and Geography exam series. Okay, so quickly, what is a drainage basin? Uh, a drainage basin, uh, this is an area that is drained by a river and its tributaries. And tributaries are smaller rivers that flow into a larger one. So usually it's an area that is drained by a river and its tributary is referred to as a drainage basin. And this diagram here depicts a drainage basin, uh, showing all the features that every drainage basin should have. First, here is the source. And source is usually the point where the river starts. So where the river starts is the source and is usually in an upland area. Then you also have tributaries, like I said earlier, there are small rivers that join a larger one. So this is also a tributary and this is also a tributary. So there are smaller rivers that join a larger one. Then we have a watershed, which is these dotted lines. And they are usually imaginary lines that separate two drainage basins. So that means you can have another drainage basin um, located here. Uh, but however, you find out that this drainage basin is entirely different uh, from this one. So it is separated by a line also. So it's an imaginary line separating two drainage basins. Then this is the channel of the river, the main channel through which the water flows. Then a confluence is the point where two rivers meet. So the point where two rivers join or meet is referred to as the confluence of a river. So this is also a confluence. This is also a confluence. This is a confluence. This is a confluence. This is a confluence. So the point where two river meet. Then all river usually have the mouth. Uh, when you look at the journey from the source to the mouth, and the mouth is where the river ends and flow into a sea or a lake. Okay, that's the by drainage basin. So hydrological cycle. So hydrological cycle is hydro here means water. So it is also referred to as the water cycle. So what are the main features of a hydrological cycle? So what you should know is uh, the hydrological cycle is a closed cycle, meaning that uh, the amount of water on earth is constantly recycled through the whole system. So within the hydrological cycle, there are what is referred to as stores and transfers. So uh, stores are where usually where water is stored temporarily, where water is kept and uh, temporarily, temporarily. So it can actually um, also live where it is kept. So transfers are the processes, or usually I refer to uh, the processes and through which water moves. Through which water moves. So, so on this water circle, you will see. So, if you look at the water circle, you will definitely see each of these transfers and processes. So, here is the red ones are the transfers, while the um, blue ones are the stores. So, you find that that. Let me start from the top here. Um, precipitation. So precipitation is is um, uh, the process through which um, water, uh, be it snow, um, rain, hail, um, gets into the earth surface, through which it comes into the earth surface from a uh, cloud. Now, once it comes into the earth surface, some of it are stored in form of ice and uh, snow, and some of them are intercepted. So it's the process through which water um, gets stopped by trees or rooftops before they get to the earth surface. So the leaves and the trees here, we intercept it and act as store temporarily uh, for a short period of time before it flows to the earth. 
Now, some of them land on the head surface directly. So once they get to the head surface, different processes now happen. It flows on the head surface and the process through which water moves on the head surface is referred to as overland flow. And sometimes it is also called surface flow. Now, so as the water flow on the surface, it can also move into lakes, which can act as a store also. Now, as water reaches the earth's surface, some flow on the earth's surface, so as it's flowing, some move into the earth's surface. So the movement of water from the surface into the soil, in this case, this is the soil now, is referred to as infiltration. The movement of water from the earth's surface into the soil is referred to as infiltration. So once water move down into the soil, some of them flow beneath the soil, and they will still find their way back to the sea and the ocean. And that process is referred to as a true flow, which is the movement of water beneath the earth's surface. And um, uh, movement of water in the soil beneath the earth's surface is true flow. Another name for this can be called uh, subsurface flow, subsurface. So not on the surface, it's beneath the surface, subsurface flow of water. Now, uh, water from the soil can move further downward into rocks. So the movement of water through the soil into rocks is referred to as percolation. The movement of water from the soil into rocks is referred to as percolation. And inside the rocks, there are two types of rocks. You can have permeable and permeable. And you also have impermeable rocks. impermeable rocks. Now the difference is that permeable rocks allow water to pass through it while impermeable rocks do not allow water to pass through it. So water also moves beneath this rock um, and the process through which water moves beneath rocks are referred to as groundwater flow. So they move all of them we now find their way back to large water body let's say the ocean or the sea now, once there is sunlight from the atmosphere, uh, usually they help to trigger the process of evaporation. Evaporation is the conversion of water into water vapor. So the water from water to water vapor. So it convert to water vapor and move into the atmosphere. So heat also can also trigger the process of evapotranspiration which is the loss of water from plant also into water vapor. They get into the atmosphere. So the higher you go, the cooler it becomes. So as this water vapor moves into the atmosphere, it loses heat and now condenses. Once it condenses, it will now lead to the formation of clouds. And these clouds, once they grow into large precipitable size, they fall back as rain. That's the hydrological circle. Now, here are the transfers that took place in the hydrological circle. So you can actually pause the video and read the meaning of each of these words. I've already explained them, so you just need to pause and, and read them or write them down, very important. Now let's look at the characteristics of a river. Now, so if you look at the river, uh, in this case, this diagram is trying to depict what we are looking at. So if this is a river, now the first thing we look at is the bed, which is the bottom of the river. So if this is a river channel, uh, the bed here, this is the bottom of the river, is referred to as the bed, while the banks are the sides of the river. So a river usually have two banks. So here is one bank, this is the bank of a river. The way you hear the width of the river is the distance between two banks of the river. So the distance from here to here, these two banks, is referred to as the width of the river. Now, the depth is the distance from the water surface to the bed of the river. So if this is the surface of the water, from the water surface down to the bed is usually referred to as the depth of the river. Then speed of flow is how fast the water in the river is moving. Then the wetted perimeter is the part of the river that have contact with water. So if you look at this, this area have contact with water. So this area that have contact with water is referred to as the wetted perimeter. Then the channel is the root course or the path through which the water flow. Uh, so it's between the bed and the bank that the a river flow. Then we have a word called the talweg. Uh, the talweg here I refer to as the fastest part 
of a river. So the part of the river that flows the fastest. So next, we we'll look at a river profile. So this simply means uh, changes in river characteristics and a river profile is the changes that happen in a river from its source. Remember, we looked at that when we looked at drainage basin from its source to the mouth of a river. So there are two things. We look at the cross profile and the long profile. That will help us to understand the characteristics of the river at each of these uh, uh, um, different, each of this part. So in the long profile, the long profile of a river shows the changes in the river gradient from the source to the mouth. So if this is the water from the source here, as it moves down to the mouth, you look at changes in the profile. So the profile here, you find out that at is divided into three parts. We have the upper course, the middle course, and the lower course. Now within the upper course, you find out that the slope here is, it has a steep slope because the river is usually, the source is usually an upland area, while as you move from the source to the mouth, the slope decreases. So you find out that here have more of the lower course have strictly gentle slope. So you find out that most long profile have a concave shape with similar characteristics. So as you can see, uh, now the source is usually in an upland area, which we've stated. So if you look at the distance here above sea level, you find that the source is usually around here. We are looking at 550 meters. So it's an upland area. So as it moves down, it moves um, to a lowland area. So the upper course of a river include areas with steep, with uneven surface. Then in the middle course, the gradient decreases as you move from the upper to the lower course. Now, another very important thing we need to look at is now the cross profile of a river. Now, when they say the cross profile, you are looking at the profile. If, if this is a river, let me use this now. From Let's say we are moving from the source down to the mouth of a river. And we've been able to establish that this part is the upper course. Then I have my middle and I have my lower course here. Now, when you hear cross profile, so let's say this is the water moving here in this river. So that means this is one bank, this is another bank, two banks. So the cross profile is the profile from, we are looking at from this point to this point, let's say from A to B. So we are looking at this. What are the features you find when you move across? You look at the cross profile of that river. So the same thing, we look at that for the middle and we look at that for the lower course. So quickly, let's look at the cross profile of a river. Okay. Um, so first, the cross profile of a river are cross sections from one bank to another, like I explained. Now, cross profile of the upper, middle, and lower course show the changes in the river channel. So if you come down here, let's pick the upper course first. So if you do the cross profile from the upper course, this is now the two banks that we are looking at, bank, bank. So this is the water flowing in it. So the first thing, if, if you look at this, it has, like we said earlier, it has a steep slope. It has a steep slope. Now, the distance from the water surface, that's the depth, is low. So you find out that that makes it shallow. It has, it is shallow, it's not that deep. It has a steep slope and it is actually narrow, it's not wide. Then it has a low velocity, that's the rate at which the water moves is very low. Then large bed loads, that's the uh, materials carried by the river is large because it's in the upper course, so a high rate of weathering have taken place. Then it has a rough, channel because it's highland area and high levels of friction and vertical erosion. So 
as the water moves within a cross profile, uh, if you look at the cross profile, so as the water moves in the upper course, it moves downward. So it moves, it has vertical erosion taking place. But areas that have a more gentle slope, what you have in that area is that the water will move in this direction, making it what? A lateral uh, uh, flow. So vertical flow in the upper course, then you have lateral flow in the middle and the lower course of a river. So uh, in the middle course, what are the characteristics you find in the middle course of a river? Uh, one of the characteristics is that it is deeper than the upper course. It has a more gentle side valley, not as steep, then wider than the upper course channel. It has greater velocity than the upper course. Materials in the river decrease in size because it has undergone the process of abrasion and erosional processes. So they have been broken down into smaller pieces into smaller pieces then it has a smoother uh, channel unlike the upper course that have a rough channel now the lower level of it has a lower level of friction and here is lateral erosion then if you come to the lower course you find out that this you can easily have high amount of flood plains these are flood plains um, it has flood plains here and the water is not it's it is usually very deep it has a very wide channel so it is deeper than the middle and upper course. It has a flat flood plane, wider than the middle course. It has greater velocity, therefore, and materials carried are mainly sediment and alluvium, so which makes the flood plane very what fertile and suitable for agriculture. It is smooth, it has a smooth channel, it has the lowest friction, and most of what happens here, you remember these other two, you have vertical and lateral erosion, but here you have deposition taking place of this material. So reasons why the flow of a river varies during the year. So during the course of a year, you find out that the volume of water in a river changes, it's, it, it varies. So some of those reasons are there is variation in the amount of precipitation. So the amount of rainfall within the year changes. So because of it changes, you find out that uh, the amount or the flow of a river also varies. Another reason is that there is different, variation here means the difference, sorry. So there is difference in the intensity of precipitation outside the amount, the intensity also varies. Now, heavier or more intense precipitation will lead to more runoff. So if the water is more, you find out that the rate of erosion or flow will be more. Now, there's also variation in temperature. So because of temperature changes, you expect that the rate of evaporation will also be different. So rate of evaporation, rate of evaporation is also different during the course of the year. So you expect that um, the rate of water flow will also change. Now different amount of moisture loss to evapotranspiration and transpiration or evaporation occur in different seasons. So degree to which ground is saturated. So saturation here is the amount of water that the soil can hold. Then glaciers, ice, and snow melt could cause higher level, usually in the spring, and more extraction of water, usually in summer. So these are some reasons why there is variation in uh, river flow within the course of the year. Now, we're done with the part one aspect of what we need to look at. So. Um, you can also, after that, you should be able to watch uh, the part two aspect where we we'll look at the work of a river, we we'll look at the erosional, transportational, and depositional processes of a river.